to make some of my staff less nervous knowing that I hit that record button because I tend to forget that. <laughs> Welcome everybody. My name is Todd Kukon. I'm with the Portage County Business Council. We're excited to partner with the Stevens Point Area Public School District and they will be sharing their reopening plan for 2020-21. And I just want to give a lot of credit to, uh, to Megan, the school board, and Craig and Corey and the staff, all the teachers and students for what they've been dealing with since this all started several months ago. And still a lot of unknowns throughout the course of the year. But if you don't have a plan, you have no way to adjust when things happen. And I know maybe Corey or Craig are going to go share, but there's a lot of school districts in the state and across the country that have reached out to Stevens Point. So there's a lot of pride in our community as well for this plan that they put together. And I'm sure they'll be the first to admit that it might not be perfect, but it's, it's an excellent plan. And glad you're all online and, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing a lot more about it. If you do have questions during the course of the presentation, we would ask that you post them in the chat window. And if you're not familiar with Zoom, that's along the bottom of your screen, you'll see some, uh, the, some buttons pop up. One of those is a, a chat button. You can enter your question in there and then at the right point in time or at the end, we'll ask questions of folks. Uh, for those of you that are really savvy and can adjust your backgrounds, we ask that you obviously keep those, those clean. That's a public service announcement. Uh, if you choose to, if, if you're not seeing the slideshow, sometimes if you pin the presenters, the Stevens Point Schools, hit that little three buttons in the upper right-hand corner of the Stevens Point Schools, that can help you see the, the three presenters. We also ask that you keep your, uh, your audio on mute and uh, because we're not gonna have an opportunity for an open mic because we have well over 100 people on the call. But again, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, please put them in the chat box and we will make sure to, to get your question on. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Craig Gerlach. Craig is the school district uh, superintendent of schools. And uh, Craig, thanks to you and your team for being here and we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks, Todd. Uh, joining me is uh, Corey Hirschberger, our Assistant Superintendent and Director of uh, Elementary Education, and Meg Erler, our School Board President. Um, in a couple of minutes here, I'll just turn this over to Corey. She's going to uh, go over the reopening schools plan that was approved by the School Board about two weeks ago. Um, you know, alluding to what Todd had said, you know, we literally are, uh, not literally, figuratively, uh, uh, building a plan as we fly it here. This is on Georgia uh, territory. Uh, for all of us, uh, yet we've been planning this for months, um, certainly using CDC um, recommendations as, as well as feedback and information from the Department of Public Instruction, uh, as well as our uh, local CESA, um, which represents uh, school districts in central Wisconsin, specifically uh, superintendents, um, from our, our conference, from, from our Valley Conference, as well as uh, many Zoom meetings with my state organization, which is the Wisconsin Association of School District Administrators. Uh, the DPI put out their framework or guidelines, and again, they are just guidelines, uh, I believe two weeks ago. Uh, we feel that, that our plan um, parallels quite well what the DPI is recommending. And when I say recommending, uh, it is just that we as a school district um, need to create our own plan independent from, from uh, any um, uh, mandates from the state of Wisconsin. There's been a tremendous amount of time put into this. Uh, my cabinet has been instrumental in, in preparing this with, uh, with many other staff members uh, as it relates to what the beginning of school is going to look like. We will be opening up face-to-face summer school next Monday, where we'll uh, be bringing in approximately 1,200 students, which is considerably uh, less students than we typically would for summer school. Um, so we have all the safety measures uh, that uh, we'll be talking about during this presentation in place. Um, and that will serve as a, as a really strong uh, pilot program in terms of some of the issues that we likely will see. We, we have a lot of, uh, we have more um, questions and answers um, that will continue because this is just new and, and of course when we bring back children to school we're going to be faced with um, some issues that that we've talked about we, we foresee some of it um, and on the other hand there's going to be probably uh, a number of uh, surprises given that so what i will say with the school board is we both approved the plan 
um, and for the district to move forward using the plan again as broad guidelines to really dig into all the specific details and that's what staff is going to be doing for the next couple of months because every bullet point that you're going to hear in this presentation is going to take a ton of work behind the scenes to then create the reality of how that's going to happen. The board also authorized our superintendent Craig to make those decisions um, without having to come back to the board with respect to, for example, if there is a positive case that occurs, um, it will be up to Craig um, in the same way as snow days work in our district to be able to um, make the best decisions um, in the timing that's necessary to ensure the safety and security of all of our students and our families and our staff. Our goal is to get children back in school safely. Uh, that said, we know we'll have uh, issues regarding staff and students um, that will be tested positive for COVID. And, and of course, we'll, our plan will allow us to go in and out of, of uh, traditional face-to-face um, -face mm -hmm. instruction as well as a blended model in our, in our secondary school, depending on uh, scenarios from one building to the next or course district by So with that being said, I'll jump right into the presentation. Um, as Craig and Meg had mentioned, um, we are really learning to test our flexibility this year. We're adjusting and adapting um, our plan daily and we have been in contact with the Bridge County uh, Health Department since March and some days it's multiple times a day. Um, so we can't say enough about the guidance and the collaboration that, that, that they've provided us throughout this process. So there have been three commitments that we have held ourselves to throughout the entire um, development of this plan and throughout our work on a daily basis. And that is safety, instruction, and flexibility. So keeping our students and our staff safety at the top of our list um, has been number one. We want to make sure that whatever we do, no matter what model we're in, um, everyone is, is safe. And, and we'll do that to the best of our ability, um, knowing that there's new information and, and details about um, the virus coming every day that we need to um, take into account. Instruction, um, like Craig had mentioned, we're really interested in getting our kids back to school in a traditional learning environment. Um, so that has been our focus. We know that child care within our community is a concern. Um, and we know that if people can't get, get back to work, um, it affects our economy. So our goal is to bring, bring our kids and staff back, um, if at all possible, um, every day next year. But we know that that might not happen in, in all situations. Um, and flexibility. So we, we've had to be flexible. We've adjusted, we've adapted, um, and we need to continue to do that throughout the next year because um, things as we once knew it are not going to be that way um, forever, probably going forward. So our physical spaces. Um, we have uh, been uh, putting things in place for summer school. We've got four summer school buildings where we've started to test some of of these operational procedures. So in all of our public spaces, we have plexiglass uh, in our offices and other public spaces throughout our buildings. We've got markers because as we know, 4K kindergarten, first grade students might not know exactly what six feet is. So we've got markers within our buildings, um, indoors and outdoors to help students know how far they need to stay away from each other, as well as adults. Sometimes adults need to be reminded of that as well. Uh, safety signage for hand hygiene, you know, social distancing, symptoms, that sort of thing. All of our water drinking stations, uh, we've had to shut down so, so students and staff can drink from those. We have only uh, water filling stations. We're encouraging students to bring water bottles uh, whenever they possibly can. And if they don't, we'll make sure that we're providing disposable cups for them to drink from. We've increased our sanitation stations within all of our buildings, and we're going to encourage hand sanitizing frequently throughout the day. And then locker usage. We know that our lockers are really close together, 
and we can't allow students to use those spaces like they once did. So we're going to have to be creative about um, rotating the use of lockers. For summer school, we are going to discourage any locker usage at this time. So when we do start up in the fall, um, we'll have plans in place for that. And then we've had to remove some of our furniture that's um, in many of our classrooms to allow for that six feet of space for student desks. We've had to reconfigure lots of workspaces for staff, um, teaching spaces for staff, and then we've had to um, make sure that we've got our isolation room available in the event that a staff or a student comes down with uh, COVID symptoms. Uh, healthy environments, we've increased and will continue to monitor on a frequent basis our ventilation systems within our buildings. We've enhanced all of our cleaning and disinfecting protocols. Um, objects, elementary buildings specifically, and sometimes at the secondary level, we've got um, students that share crayons and markers and that sort of thing. We've had to eliminate all of that, so we're encouraging families um, to send students with their own personal items that they'll just keep and then they will um, utilize in their bucket or space underneath their desk uh, for just themselves. Communal spaces, gyms, cafeterias, those are gonna look very different. Um, in the fall, some students may be eating lunch in a cafeteria space, some students may be eating in the classroom. So we know that we're not gonna be able to have our, our lunch within our cafeterias like we once did, that's going to look very, very different moving forward. Uh, we talked about hand hygiene, modifying our building layouts. Um, in our survey that we gave to, to staff and to families, um, both of those groups indicated that they were very concerned about our traffic flow patterns within our buildings. So we have had to adjust our entrances and exits to the buildings. Uh, we have had to adjust our, our traffic flow within the buildings, and we've had to actually move some of our classroom spaces based on numbers of students within those classrooms to make sure that if we've got large groups of kids, they're in our biggest classrooms. If we have smaller groups of kids, they'll be in our smaller classrooms. Day to day, uh, we are going to limit non-essential visitors and visits to the building. So we are only going to ask that um, our staff and students be present in those buildings. We are not going to allow any um, volunteers or, or parents into the buildings at this time. We are going to just keep it to staff and students. Um, we have been encouraged and we know that it's really, really important for us to keep groups of kids together um, at one time. So we're not going to be having students switch to classes like they once did. They are going to stay in their cohort group and then staff will rotate in if they have to um, rather than kids moving about the building. We talked about entrances and exits, um, face coverings. Right now uh, we've got bus drivers that are delivering lunches and we have I've been working with the Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA. Um, and right now, for summer school starting on Monday, we are asking our staff, as the bus drivers, uh, that they wear face masks or shields if they're not able to social distance that six feet. Um, and and uh, that starts on Monday. But our bus drivers right now are wearing face coverings, delivering the meals and taking our students uh, from the YMCA to Glacier Hollow. Field trips and gatherings are being monitored very, very closely. Um, we are not able to do some field trips that have normally happened during summer school or maybe happening in the fall of the year. We've had to limit those depending on where they're going, how many students are going, and what sort of safety protocols are in place at the location that they're going. So, Let's say if it's a summer school class of 15 that wants to go to a park, absolutely we would allow for that to happen. But going to nursing homes or other public spaces that just aren't considered to be the safest places right now, we are going to say, no, we're not gonna let uh, staff take, take students to those locations. Um, we, we know we're likely going to have to reassign some staff. 
um, just based on what happens throughout the year. Um, if you know we come down with a, with a positive case um, and that teacher is not able to be available, we're going to have to do some adjusting of staff within the building. We also know that there's some um, auxiliary type staff and some support staff that may need to um, help out in different places throughout the day. So all of our jobs are changing um, and we all just need to go back to that commitment that we talked about of flexibility and know that this year is going to, to be very different. Um, if we have high risk staff and we know that we do that for medical reasons and we know we've got students for medical reasons that may not be able to come back to school or um, may be able to only come back on a limited basis, we need to be prepared for that and we need to be flexible for that. Um, there's been designated uh, COVID-19 point of contact personnel, which for students, it's me. If it's a staff member, Beth Bakanovich, our human resources director, is responsible for that. Communication. Uh, frequent. We, we know there are lots of questions and concerns and um, parents are, are, are wondering what's going to happen that very first day. So we're um, finishing up our communication right now that's going to go out either today or tomorrow about that first day of summer school so that we're all on the same page and we're all operating from the same standards. Transportation. Um, Chris Wodzinski and his staff deserve a lot of credit. He's been working since March to get our transportation in place. This was another area that parents were really concerned about. Um, I will say that when we did survey our, our parents, 82% of our parents had indicated that they could um, transport their own children to school and would not necessarily need our transportation. So we were encouraged by that. Um, we know that that was a survey given at one point in time and that number may be more or it could be less right now. But we are prepared on our buses to, to have each bus only have 24 students or less on a bus. Um, however, if there are families that have multiple siblings, there may be a few more. Those siblings would be able to sit in the same seat on that bus, but other than that, we are going to have just one student per seat, having them sit next to the window so that we can social distance. Um, we feel good about the fact that our buses, all of our buses have high seat backs, which is another barrier. Um, and, and Bridge County Health was encouraged by that also. So we know that as many barriers that you can put in place, um, it's another um, safety precaution. We have had to make some adjustments with routes. We've had approximately 40 additional routes added to do this 24 students or less. And we had to bring all of our sub drivers or most of our sub drivers into our norm normal routes. So we're anticipating um, needing some sub drivers. So if anybody out there has their CDL and is really interested in, in driving a bus, uh, let us know please because we, we need drivers. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, face coverings, those are um, taking place right now with all of our drivers and those will continue during summer school. Um, health and safety. Enhanced protocols on the buses, they're cleaning those uh, frequently. In between routes, we have machines that are able to um, put a fog throughout the bus that puts a, a covering over our seats that, again, is just another barrier. Um, special needs students, if there are any families out there that have special needs, we are going to in, uh, continue to work with IEP teams to make sure that those accommodations are made with any students that have special needs. And then parents, if they're able and willing to self-transport, that will help us a lot. If they're not, that's okay, we'll make accommodations. And then drop off and pick up zones. We're anticipating that with um, an increase of families um, dropping kids off and picking kids up, there's gonna be a lot of congestion around our buildings. So please be patient with that. Uh, we know we may have to make some adjustments to traffic flow patterns around the buildings, with uh, parent vehicles, as well as with some of our buses. So now we're gonna jump right into our instructional models. So this is the traditional classroom model. This is where all of our kids are back in the classrooms with all of our staff. Um, we know that that is not gonna look the same as it did when we left in March. 
So when we come back, again, safety is our top priority. We will be or may be reassigning staff um, to make sure that we're able to provide those safety precautions and those distancing efforts that we know we have to do. We know that our schedules are gonna need modification. Uh, lunch, recess, we're gonna have to stagger students. We will not send large groups of kids to the cafeteria. We will not send large groups of kids out for recess. We also know that social and emotional needs of our staff, of our families, and of our students was a, a top priority before we went into this, and we know it's gonna be even a bigger issue coming back. So we need to make sure that we're able to identify families that may be struggling, identify staff that may be struggling, and students, and we adjust and adapt and provide support for those families um, as, as we're able to. So that is, that is key for us. We need to make sure that we're all in a good place because we know learning can happen if, if we're not. Um, we know it's gonna have an impact on our budget. Uh, it already has and it will continue to throughout the year. The board is aware of that. Uh, we have been able to receive some CARES Act funding, um, but of course that's never enough to take care of all of the, the increased resources that we've had to commit to this effort. Um, we also learned from our families that there are some families that just do not feel comfortable sending their kids back to a face-to-face -face environment or a traditional classroom learning environment no matter what. So we are preparing right now for grades seven through 12. We have some online options for students to do full-time. Um, we need to enhance and increase those. But at the elementary level, we don't have a total online option, but we will have when we come back in the fall. We are in the research phase right now. Uh, we're looking at three different uh, programs that we're going to be able to collaborate with to provide that for families. And once we gather all of the research and make a determination, uh, we'll share that information with families and, and make sure that they, they know that that opportunity is there if they so choose. We also know that some families may want to do that all year. Some may want to do it a half a year. Some may want to make a decision on a month to month basis or a week to week basis. So we, we're gonna provide that opportunity to families. Communication, we're gonna continue communicating with families when we're in this model, and we know that we're gonna to have to move between all of our models throughout the year. The next is blended. Blended is only for students in grades seven through 12. We do not offer blended at this time for elementary. The purpose of this was to um, minimize the number of students in our secondary buildings. And the reason why we chose not to do a blended model for elementary is because a large percentage of our families and community indicated that childcare is a concern. So we made every effort to make sure that our elementary students were in our classrooms in a safe environment. Um, because Child care is a concern. I mean, we were told that there were kids as young as second, you know, first, second, third grade staying home alone. That, that we're concerned about. Um, we don't want to put any student in an unsafe environment. We also know that more employers are calling people back to work. And if they're going back to work and there's no child care, what, what do kids do, you know? during the day. So it was important to us to get our kids back um, in our classrooms for elementary. In a secondary building, what this would look like is we would create two cohorts, a cohort A and a cohort B. If you were in cohort A, you would attend class on Monday and Tuesday. Um, and then on Wednesday, it would be an e-learning day. And then on Thursday and Friday, it would continue to be an e-learning day. If you are cohort B, you would be an e-learning Monday through Wednesday, and then you would come back to the building on Thursday and Friday. And the reason we did that is because then on Wednesday, we would also do a deep clean of the building, and we would provide um, that teacher prep day to plan for a week's worth of lessons. Um, 
devices and access. It's very, very important to make sure that we do everything we can to make sure families have devices in their hands and they have internet access. Our technology team is doing the very best that they can and they're continuing to communicate with many um, internet service providers out there to even increase what we have in place now so that every child has access to the internet. Are we there yet? No, but we're continuing to work towards that. Early identification. Again, um, teachers and schools need to be able to identify those struggling learners early and make sure that um, we're, we're responding to that. If we go into a blended learning environment, we will go back to the traditional grading. So we'll go A through F um, for secondary students and we'll continue the one through four for elementary students. And again, we could be in a traditional learning environment to start with, but we may have to switch to a blended learning environment at any point in time. So we need to be flexible and ready for that. E-learning is pretty much what we were doing from March until the end of the year. Um, so we would do um, Monday, Tuesday e-learning. Um, Wednesday would continue to be at e-learning as would Thursday and Friday, but there would be a teacher prep day on that Wednesday if we, if we go to the e-learning. And this would be for all students. 4K through 12. We already addressed the device and access. We addressed the early identification. Again, in this model, we would do the traditional grading. Um, and again, this could be a model that we might have to do by classroom, by school, or the entire district. So if we have a classroom at Jefferson Elementary School that we feel um, needs to be shut down for a, sh a period of time, we may need to jump into an e-learning environment for one classroom or a building or a district. And as Meg mentioned earlier, Craig has the ability to shift between those models at any point in time throughout the year. Keep in mind uh, when those decisions get made, I obviously will be leaning on, on, on my cabinet to assist. I will also be in constant communication um, with, with Meg earlier in terms of um, the decisions whether or not we're going to switch one from uh, one model to, to the next. Um, that said, some of these decisions might be made a day ahead of time, depending on what happens uh, throughout uh, the, the district and each specific building. So what I just presented was basically our, our core or our shell, our universal instruction. We also know that we've got special ed situations um, that we need to make sure that we're, we're ready and prepared for. So we're working on what do those special education environments look like um, and making sure that we're following all of our safety protocols. What do our caseloads look like within those environments? And then we have a lot of staff that travel within our district. So we're going to make sure that we, we limit that travel as much as possible. And again, keep those teachers and kids in cohorts as, as, as much as we possibly can. So we're working on, on the special education piece um, as it pertains to that universal instruction. I, I mentioned early, earlier social and emotional health. Um, we're working on some reboarding uh, protocols for bringing kids and families back into our buildings that look very different. Uh, we shot yesterday for the first time, um, and we're going to continue doing this every week up through the start of the year, a video that uh, we know that people are on information overload right now with everything coming at them, and it's hard to keep up on all the reading. So we're going to put together a short snippet video that will inform community, it will inform staff, it will inform families and students about topics or, or frequently asked questions that we keep getting from people. So this week's topic is going to be um, the start of summer school. So we, we shot a video that which shows what do some of our indoor spaces look like, you know? So when students come back, they see people in masks, they see people, um, you know, with a plexi shield between them. Um, outside, we've, we're gonna have spaces painted on our grass spaces and on our playgrounds that show the six feet. So things are gonna be different and we need to make sure that, that we're 
helping to teach some of these new things that are in place because students haven't, haven't seen them before. Um, climate and culture of our buildings is essential. We need to make sure that we're, we're taking care of each other and um, being responsive to, to everyone's needs. Uh, we've got some universal instruction that we're working to enhance as it pertains to social and emotional learning, make, making sure that our staff are taken care of, our staff are not in a good place. Um, you know, we're not okay with that. We want to make sure that our staff are feeling good about the, the safety protocols, that they're in a good place to take care of the kids and families as they enter our buildings. Um, and wellness, you know, we've got some, we've got some wellness um, assistance out there in the event that our families need something beyond, um, you know, what we can provide during the, the normal workday. Extracurricular activities we're working on. Um, WIAA has provided some guidance. And again, we've been in communication with Portage County and um, we are going to start um, bringing back some athletic type activities using some of our um, gyms and weight rooms starting July 13th, but with you know, groups of no more than 10 and very enhanced safety protocols. So slowly starting to reopen some of that as we are able. As I mentioned earlier, um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but we did survey our staff and we did survey our families. Um, we really found the same information from both groups. Um, and that was, you know, they were concerned about the traffic flow patterns, they were concerned about transportation, and, um, you know, we were, we were happy to hear that information that families and staff gave, gave us really supported the direction that we were, that we were heading in. Um, we had about 88% of our, our respondents indicate that they wanted to get students back in the classroom in a traditional format or a face-to-face -face environment. And also the 82% of families that had indicated that they could transport. Those were really um, the two big things that, that came out of the stakeholder input. This is a quick visual that talks about the importance of making sure that we're able in an elementary situation, uh, move between the traditional model to an e-learning at any given point in time. So we're gonna be prepared for that next year as we, as we start the year. And then at the secondary level, we could go from a traditional to an e-learning or a traditional to a blended, and then blend it to an e-learning and back and forth. So again, just the need for flexibility um, at any given point in time. The next slides really focus on that safety piece and the flexibility. And this shows some criteria that Craig and others will utilize when making a decision to move between any one of our three models. So there's lots of verbiage here. I'm not going to read through this, but basically we will focus on the health and safety of everyone, um, what are family and community needs and capacity, and then that social and emotional piece as we, as we go about any one of those, those plans. With that, I know we've got about 15 or 20 minutes left. I'm sure there's lots of questions. So we are going to open it up for anything that might be in the chat that you feel we need to address that we haven't. Yeah, thank you, Corey. Appreciate that. And Craig and Meg as well. We do have a number of questions. So I guess we'll look for as, as best short answers as you can, you can give to these. First question, will the YMCA be allowed to utilize the school buildings still before and after for uh, before and after school care? Yep, I can answer that. So we are going to allow Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA to utilize our buildings for before and after school care. But beyond that, we are not allowing any of the other volunteer type programs or programming to take place uh, at this time. Thank you, Corey. Uh, previously, children with fevers were required to stay home until they were fever free for 24 hours. Will that continue? 
or will there be the 14 day quarantine, per quarantine period or a required COVID test? So we are asking um, children to stay home for 24 hours if they have a fever of 100.4 or higher. Um, we have some flow charts that we are going to share um, shortly once we get the approval from Portage County um, that show exactly what protocol we follow if an employee becomes ill or has symptoms of COVID and what we do if a child has symptoms. So it lays out exactly who's <clears throat> responsible for what and what uh, protocol you follow in the event that there are COVID type symptoms. And I think so it's that, important, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. That, that'll be coming out shortly, Todd. Thank you. And I think yep. it's important for everybody to know on the call that this, this is, as, as Craig and Corey and Meg have said, an evolving plan. And uh, as, as more information becomes available, more details, uh, those will obviously be shared with everybody. Another yep. question, any introductory plans for the in, incoming seventh grade students to the junior highs? That's a good question. Um, we haven't had a specific conversation regarding seventh grade as it relates to COVID. Um, we will look at that. Obviously, uh, we we have uh, we lost the last three months of school where we would have had opportunities to, to talk about that transition. So um, we will uh, make note of that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like you're going to use part of that first week anyway to get everybody kind of back into the right. flow as well. Uh, do, does anybody know in terms of, are the private schools going to be following the same plan? Do you have any, any idea on that yet? We have a community meeting uh, every Tuesday, Todd, you were on that. We have a representation from Michelli and um, St. Paul um, that participates in that. Obviously, uh, they tie directly into our, our, our transportation. Um, we also have uh, had several meetings with Portage County and all of the superintendents within Portage County um, and represent to include representatives from the private schools. Um, so I haven't seen their plan. Um, I know that they are planning, uh, uh, I'll say specifically Pacelli because they brought it up this morning, are, are planning on, on going face to face um, this fall. My guess is you will see something similar, but you'll have to uh, uh, hear that from them. Yeah. I, and, I believe and, they yeah. indicated that they're planning on releasing their plan within the next week or two. Right. And they, they also have a transition in leadership with Greg Hansel leaving and, and Cindy Weber coming on board. So we'll certainly yeah. be hearing more from them. Uh, two questions about face coverings. What about face coverings for building staff and, and students and some of the conversations we're hearing about that? Right now we're requiring bus drivers and food service um, to, to wear masks when school resumes, um, staff members that are unable to social distance will, will be required to wear a shield and or a mask. Um, we are not requiring at this particular point in time masks for students. I think somebody had mentioned up here uh, referring to, to, to research. Um, the research is fairly strong that we need children to get back in school. Uh, requiring masks creates, for children, uh, a complete, uh, just a, a number of other issues. Um, getting those masks is one, but requiring students to wear them would be another. Um, and, and those of you that have children or have been around children, trying to manage students wearing masks and, and, and masks falling on the floor and students wearing each other's masks students tearing masks off one another would create a number of uh, complications. So, um, and we have bounced all of this off uh, Portage County as well. What I'm seeing uh, um, and, and trending is just that staff and adults will be wearing uh, masks and or shields, uh, students uh, likely not. Okay. So, so, so I also want to emphasize, you know, we currently this summer, working with the Boys and Girls Club, who currently are operating pop-up sites at two of our facilities. With the Y, we are providing transportation to them um, for camp, their, their summer camp out at Glacier Hollow, as well as our summer school coming up in the next several weeks. They really are going to help 
continue to inform us about what best practices are with respect to masks. And we are talking with you today. I mean, this is the 7th of July. We all know, based on what we know from the last several months, that we're gonna have different questions and different information um, come August. And the district is committed to continuing to follow best practices in consultation with Portage County, uh, as well as being aware of what CDC is providing us, what the state is providing us, to ensure, as Corey pointed out, that, that our students and our staff are safe. That's the number one priority. Um, so when we talk about masks today and what we're doing, that's what we're doing today based on the best information that our district's being provided. Um, but we, again, one of our three guide guideposts is flexibility and ensuring that we are continuing to daily, um, and the district really has been pretty much in consultation with Portage County daily, um, make the decisions um, that are going to keep our students and our staff safe. Thanks, Meg. For, uh, for blended learning, I'm guessing this, this would be the 7th through 12th, would siblings be in the same cohort group? No, not, not no, because uh, they would not be in the same grade level. So um, cohort groups are going to be much easier to implement at the elementary level. At the secondary level, um, it's much more difficult to do the cohort groups just based on their schedule. Hey, Corey, it's Sarah O'Donnell. Yep. I think they're referring to the cohorts for blended. So cohort A attending on Monday, Tuesday, and uh, cohort B, which would be by last name. And thank if, you. Yep, and if yeah. we had families in a situation where maybe students didn't have to have a, the same last name, we would work with those families so we didn't have some students attending on one day and some students attending on another. Sarah, thank you for clarifying. Yes, in that situation for blended, they would be. We would divide up by last name, but again, if there are siblings that have a different last name, we would try to make an accommodation for them to be in the same cohort. Thanks, thank Sarah. you, Sarah. Yeah, that was Sarah O'Donnell, who's the uh, basically director of communication, I'll say. That might not be the legal title, but that's what Sarah does. <laughs> Um, you kind of touched on this, but who is determining when the risk is high enough to shift between models and what will those parameters be? Yeah, the board uh, authorized uh, myself to do that. Again, um, I will be in consultation daily um, with, with, the, uh, with my cabinet and then uh, make earlier um, as needed. Um, the, the parameters, you know, there are some general guidelines, uh, but it really is going to uh, uh, determine on the size of the building, the number of students involved, the number of staff involved. And it's until we actually uh, begin this process, um, there's not going to be an exact science to this. Next, uh, on Thursday, I'm going to ask each department to have um, what their thresholds are. For example, uh, a food service. If, we're, if we have a food service provider that, uh, that, that is ill, um, and that spreads throughout a specific building, for example, that, that might be a, um, a production kitchen that could shut down um, an entire school because we can't, uh, we can't produce the food. It might shut down a couple buildings depending on, on uh, what building is being served. Um, and it really does depend on the number, of the, the size of the building and the, and the number of students and, and staff involved. So that's gonna be the challenge. Um, um, determining, um, for, quite frankly, possibly from day to day, if we're going to have to shut down a classroom or classrooms, uh, or whether it's an entire building, um, or if we go back to an entire school district distant, uh, with distance learning. And, and I want to note here, again, that's where we are right now, because currently right now, there is no mandatory directives from the federal government. There are no mandatory directives from the state government. There are no mandatory directives from Portage County. And so those decisions right now are resting with each district in this state. 
I mean, that's where the decision making is at this point. Um, at any point in time moving forward, uh, different authorities may be guiding those decisions for us, as they did when we wound up shutting down schools this spring. And so, um, again, it goes back to that flexibility. So as long as that authority rests in our district, Craig will be in close contact with Portage County, as yep. well as the cabinet, to be making any of those decisions, really specific decisions. Um, but we're also very aware that um, that authority could be taken away from us right. at any point in time, mm -hmm. and then we will do everything in our power to comply with the directives that we're facing. This, this having, having no mandate uh, from the state, uh, it's a double-edged sword because we, as superintendents, we are crying out for some, for some guidance that would affect um, all school districts. So we have some level of consistency. Um, that said, we don't want to have a mandate that dictates what we're going to do uh, in Stevens Point, if the uh, if, if our circumstances are that much different than Milwaukee, which they are, or uh, Winter, Wisconsin, which they are, so um, we do enjoy some flexibility because we need that. Um, but I'll be honest, sir, there is also a level of frustration in terms of having some basic um, a basic understanding of what makes sense for all of us. Thanks, Craig. And we still got uh, probably six or seven questions up here. Uh, for elementary children, will they be starting person-in-person -person classes this fall, four days a week or five days? They would be going five days a week. And again, it comes back to that child care concern. Okay. Uh, what's the plan? I think you touched on it, but what's the plan to limit class sizes to allow for physical distancing? Will current building yep. and staffing support uh, support the need for physical distancing? Yeah, so we, we did not put a number on uh, the number of students in a classroom. Instead, we looked at the square footage of our classrooms and the number of kids that were enrolled to be in that classroom. So we've had to remove furniture, um, but for summer school, um, you know, we've had to shift some, some classes around to different rooms so that we can have that six feet of space. Alrighty. Will students, and this is an acronym, I'm, it's M-A-P-E-L-S, will students move to Maples or will Maples teachers be moving to the classrooms? Yep, the elementary principals and I are working on that right now. What Maples stands for is Music, Art, Phi Ed, and Library. And um, so we've talked about having our Maples teachers go to, to the students rather than the students go to them. However, uh, we can't bring a gym to kids. So we're gonna to have to have kids go to the gym, um, but that's not been determined, but we have talked about the possibility of having teachers come to them rather than them go to, to the gym. There's well, and I wanna note, you know, the, the plan that was presented to the board, again, was that broad plan. And right now, and, and, and administration brought it to us, we were one of the first districts to, as a board, pass it so that we as a district have two months now to really dig into all the details that are going to flesh out that plan. Well, we're probably down to a month and a half, but month we also are <laughs> a, a district that's going back to school face to face um, next week. Right. So there was uh, a, another reason why we moved on this uh, a little quicker maybe than other districts. Thanks. There's a, there's a 4K question here. Are there any different guidelines or thoughts about how 4K will be handled or they will be, or will they be handled the same as K through six? So again, this is our general structure. However, we know that 4K is really different because we've got a lot of uh, community partners that we work with. So we will work with all of those community partners um, to follow the basic general plan that we just shared today. Um, but each situation is really unique given their specific location. Uh, this question I think you touched on, but will teachers still be traveling to different schools? There will still be some, but we're going to limit that if we are able to. 
Will staff be tested prior to the start of school in the fall or only if they have symptoms? We will not be testing staff. And in fact, um, I don't even know that they would test staff if they, if they didn't have symptoms. So we um, are in the process of creating a handbook um, that we will be asking families as well as staff um, to screen and self-monitor before coming on to any of our district facilities. So um, again, we'll go back to those flow charts and that will help guide when it's appropriate to be tested and when it's not. And then we're also following um, clear guidance from, from Portage County and we'll do that work in collaboration with them. Those flow charts, those flow charts will be out um, yet this week prior to summer school. But you know, the premise is if you have symptoms, you stay home and then of course, um, there will be a process put into place depending on uh, what those symptoms are. And that basically answered the next one, which is will there be a screening process for students every day? The flow charts will handle that uh, as well. They'll say they will, but there will, we are at this particular point in time are not uh, taking temperatures, for example, of, uh, of students. Um, um, yet if they're, if they're ill, they, they'll be staying home. If we'll have a process in place when a student if a student does get ill or going to get a fever, we'll have a, a uh, uh, we'll have a, isolation. an isolation room oh. uh, until a parent can pick them up. Um, you know, all of these are really good questions. Um, at the end of the day, we, I believe, we need to get children back into school as safely as we we can. And I think we're kidding ourselves. Uh, and this has never changed. We, can, we can't ensure student safety on any given day. Um, we do the very best we do to have process in place and, and, and look towards what makes sense. And um, we look to research as it relates to uh, safety and, and security. Um, this is far from a perfect model because a perfect model just doesn't exist. We believe we've got a very good model that will allow us to get students back to school, possibly moving them from a blended learning to e-learning back to back to face to face um, and, and we don't know how long that's going to take it depends on what to read um, you know i've been I, I i'm starting to hear craig plan for 18 months of issues with with, with covid uh, as it relates to getting back into schools um, so there are going to be a number of issues that are going to come up that you know, isn't that some people just aren't going to be happy with? Um, we're we're trying to make decisions based on best practice and the feasibility of actually making this happen. Because if we follow guidelines from from every guideline that comes out, we'll never get kids back into school for quite some time. Um, so we're using the guidelines um, as just that, as as to assist us with our roadmap knowing that we've got to make some decisions um, that are going to be difficult um, as it relates to what one person might think of the other uh, so we can best get children back in the buildings. And we are, we are aware that this truly is going to require a partnership. Um, from time immemorial, if parents had a child that had a fever in the morning and needed that child to be at school, um, there was the ability to provide the child with Tylenol ahead of time. I mean, that's just a reality. Um, what we are hoping um, is that between our families and our business community and our educational community, that we can truly partner in this, um, that we can have families feel safe in keeping kids home from school if they're sick, um, that we can have staff comfortable with, you know, being up front. I mean, it, it truly, we are going to be encouraging the importance of community, that we all have to take personal responsibility for ourselves and for our children to ensure that we don't infect others. Um, but in order to do that, there's gotta be that partnership. We have to have families comfortable that, um, that their 
kids are going to have a safe place that, that they can possibly not be at work um, because they've got to be home with their children who are sick. Um, so this is a, this is a broad community discussion. And I think all of us have come to realize that COVID um, has really identified um, the fact that our schools truly provide a backbone to this community. Um, whether it's providing food, whether it's providing childcare. I mean, we are the largest free childcare provider during our school year as well as summer school in our community and, and many, many families rely on that. Um, we also support the social emotional needs of many families, um, especially those families struggling the most. Um, and then we also provide education. And so I guess we, you know, the bottom line is we have to trust that people take COVID serious and that they don't send kids to school if they're sick. A um, couple left. Are parents going to be allowed into the school to pick up students or will students be coming out like for doctor appointments during the day, that kind of thing? Yep, so we're creating that handbook that will clearly uh, help parents understand what we're going to do. Um, we are going to limit people in the building, so as much as we possibly can, we're going to ask parents to not enter, um, but we know, again, that in all cases, we might not be able to do that. So we'll have pretty strict guidelines as far as our expectations that will be out to all families soon. The weekly video snippets that you mentioned, I'm assuming those will be on the school district website when they are starting? Yes. Okay. Uh, someone asked a question, the Chromebook issuance, how will that be managed during a quick switch to e-learning for elementary students? That's kind yep, of getting so, in the weeds, um, Yep, so we actually are gonna do a one-to-one -one deployment for our third through sixth graders. So every single one of our students in third through sixth grade will have their own Chromebook that we are going to encourage them to be taking home on a regular basis. 4K through second grade, we'll still have the carts. So if we have to switch, we'll just make sure that each student gets a Chromebook off that cart and is able to uh, be sent home. If in fact a student wasn't there on a particular day um, that we made a decision to jump into e-learning, we will um, have parents uh, come to the buildings and pick those up like we did in the past. And this last one I think is more uh, summer than reopening, but um, has it been determined whether schools could be used as childcare centers? So as we mentioned earlier, um, we are working with the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club currently. Um, we are doing some transportation with the YMCA uh, to take students to Glacier Hollow. And right now, Boys and Girls Club is utilizing the Boston School for us, as well as uh, pods for programming. Um, but we had some real serious conversation about if our schools were able to be child care centers, why wouldn't we just stay in school? I mean, it kind of a little bit defeats the purpose. So right. we're going to do everything we can to keep our kids in a traditional environment, if at all possible. Um, if at some point we need to find more space for child care within our buildings, we'll have that conversation and do everything that we possibly can to support that child care concern. Let's sneak in this last one. How is the CARES funding spent? That um, is being determined right now. We have a number of requests uh, throughout the district. Um, we will be uh, prioritizing those in, in the near future and we'll have to submit that uh, for, uh, for reimbursement, but that has not uh, been determined yet. Um, obviously, it's going to uh, be used to, to mitigate uh, COVID-19 as it relates to potentially uh, transportation costs, technology costs, um, the, the need for additional um, staff re regarding uh, uh, um, student and, and staff mental health. PPE. That, uh, the PPE. Um, a, a number of requests are coming through. We are getting, receiving approximately $666,000, um, you know, which, uh, you know, to, to all of us is an awful lot of money, but uh, not, on a, not necessarily on a $100 million budget. So that, that money will go fast. 
Uh, so we will spend that um, wisely. Well, I want to thank uh, all three of you on behalf of the Portage County Business Council and all those people that are on this call and all of Portage County. Uh, this is, as you can see, we just got the, the surface view of this plan and you've certainly put a lot of time and effort into this. And I think this, uh, the last post here probably maybe sums it up best and I'll just read it. A special thank you to the teachers, faculty and administration on behalf of grateful parents for being so proactive at getting our kids back to school. So thanks very much to the three of you and we appreciate your time and, and we'll be behind you throughout the summer and into the fall. Thanks, Todd. Thank you very much and, for and the again, opportunity. If you have questions, you know, reach out to myself or Corey. We'll be uh, happy to, to discuss um, whether it be phone call, in person, uh, or, or email, knowing that uh, this is a challenge for all of us. And some of this might change as we continue to move through uh, throughout the summer uh, and into the fall. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, everybody.